<laughs> man of war, man of war, living on the road. <laughs> well, my shirt just flew off, so uh, I guess that's where we're going with this now. Uh, the muse is iron. Uh, Chris is ironing his loincloth right now. <laughs> I mean, if you guys want to form a man of war tribute band, I am all about that. I will. I used to sing "Hail and Kill" back in my Cleveland days, so I'm down for bringing that song back into the set. Yeah, I, and nobody wants me in a man of war tribute band <laughs> from my uh, visual standpoint. See, you, that was my man of war tribute band alarm going off. <laughs> 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 to the Man of War mobile. It's like any time there's an indication that I might be appearing with my shirt off, that alarm goes off and it puts a halt to the entire <laughs> proceeding. There it is. <laughs> Hi, I'm Greg. I'm the lead singer for Lipstick. I'm Steve. I'm the bassist from Lipstick. And welcome to the Lipstick panel. Today on the Lipstick panel, we are talking about the Loudness album, Disillusion. Simply because I'm sick of Chris Lathrop talking shit on my boys in Loudness on his show, Pot of Thunder. So we've got Chris Lathrop here to talk about Loudness with us. And we've also got Jeff Richard from the Fret Shack. Here to talk about Loudness and Disillusion, the band's fourth album from 1984. Now, full disclosure, I'm a really big Loudness fan. This this band is in my top ten. I adore this band. But I understand we probably have some mixed feelings about them on the panel. So I want to go around the panel, get everyone's histories with the band, their impressions of the band, and any history with this album that they might have. So... Uh, let's start with Steve, then we'll go to Chris, then Jeff, and close out with myself. Okay, so my usual modus operandi is that I listen to whatever album Greg hands me exactly once while I'm doing the rankings. But sometimes I'll, like, toss it in the car once on the way to work the day that I'm going to do the rankings, which I did with this one, and then I listened to it at work, and then I listened to it again uh, while driving home after work, because uh, it r- pleasantly reminded me of Halloween, and I am all about that life. So... That's as much as I've listened to Loudness, but I was very much enjoying it. Uh, I feel like if for 1984, they were probably doing Halloween slash Maiden better than most of what Halloween and Maiden were doing at the time. I mean, yeah, this is, I think, a great album that stands the test of time, and if you compare it to what was out at the same time, yeah, very competitive, very fresh, great musical direction, but... I know that five, five, ten years ahead of its time, probably. I know that Mr. Chris Lathrop doesn't necessarily agree. So, Chris, what are your thoughts on loudness overall? Well, here's my take on loudness, really, is uh, the only album of theirs that I was ever really aware of was the Thunder in the East album, which I suppose you could call their breakthrough album, their more mainstream sort of entry into the public consciousness at the time um and uh when i say album what i really mean is i was only aware of the uh rock and roll crazy nights cut mainly because the drummer i was in the band for the most part of the 90s would uh constantly make fun of the cut specifically the vocal inflection inflection of the chorus and so you know, I became aware of, more aware of it, uh, thanks to him. But, um, you know, I never really delved into it. And, you know, to uh, to clarify, my ire isn't necessarily directed at loudness, but uh, since I do a KISS podcast, when the song Crazy Nights came up, um, you know, I just felt that... Uh, you know, loudness had come out with rock and roll crazy nights, maybe a year or so earlier than the kiss tune. And I refuse to believe that kiss was so uh, aloof to what was going on in music that they didn't know there was a similar, similarly titled song out in the same genre a year earlier. So I always got the impression that they were actually, uh, 
taking their cues from loudness and just that whole sequence of events just never sat well with me. So it's less ire toward loudness, uh, more ire toward kiss. And as a guitar nerd in the eighties who had all the guitar magazines, obviously I was aware of Akira Takasaki, but again, never really delved into music. I will say that I think you will be surprised at some of my opinions throughout this episode. So with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Richard. I became, uh, I became aware of loudness uh, around the time that Thunder in the East came out. Um, like Chris, I'm a longtime guitar player. Uh, I absolutely live and love the guitar. And... Um, Back in the 80s, I was uh, one of those kind of guys that I was always, I was kind of like a surfer chasing waves. I was always looking for guitar players to listen to and to enjoy and draw influence from, you know, just like uh, so many of us. I know I speak for Chris. So I feel safe speaking for him when I talk about the idea, you know, we heard about our Malmsteen. We heard about our Steve Vives. We heard about our Joe Satchmanis. And I heard about this guy. Uh, who was like the Japanese uh, version of Eddie Van Halen named Akira Takasaki. And I was like, oh, I got to get my hands on this. I've got to, you know, get this. And so I picked up Hunger in the East and I was uh, immediately captivated by uh, what I heard of Akira's. Um, you know, uh, still to this day, I'm sitting here in my guitar repair shop in South Louisiana and I'm looking at the room around me and uh, I've got two mid '80s ESP guitars and a Mesa Biggie halfback just a few feet from. Um, you know, the uh, lasting impression has been here. But anyway, as far as the Disillusion album, oddly enough, I had never heard it until I got recruited into this uh, podcast and review, and uh, I was granted a copy of it uh, very recently. I listened to it front and back many, many times, and I'm ready to offer my two cents on. All right. Well, I'll I'll go next. So, with me, I've uh, I listened to uh, my my history with loudness. I think I probably have the most uh, history with the band. That you know, they're in my top ten. So obviously, I have a lot of history with them. If they're a band, I enjoy that much to make the illustrious top ten. You know, we all have our internal top 10 of bands we think are brilliant. And for me, my top 10, uh, the top five doesn't really fluctuate that much. But the second half of the top five does. But Loudness is consistently always in that second half of the top five, even as my tastes change over the years. I still find myself coming back to this band over and over again. My first exposure to, you know, Japanese music and culture at all was... You know, I, I grew up in the 90s, so I was exposed to anime and video games, and most anime had, you know, soundtracks done by Americans at that point, but a lot of the video games had Japanese composers, and I got used to the sort of the scales and the phrasings that, you know, they those kind of composers use that's more traditional Japanese, but the first Japanese song I ever heard was a song that Lipstick ended up covering, which was called Cha La Head Cha La which was done by this guy named uh, Hironobu Kagayama. And he was in this band called Lazy, which was kind of like a Deep Purple meets Van Halen kind of band. And the guitar player for that band was Akira Takasaki. And I didn't know about this, uh, you know, until years later. But it, that band was really a, a precursor to loudness, had a lot of the same sound as, as the band's early albums, so in many ways, I consider that catalog blended together with the Loudness catalog. So really, if I count that, my first exposure to the music of the Loudness is, you know, bad to early childhood. But admittedly, I didn't understand it, and I thought mm. it was kind of shitty when I first heard it. I'm like, why is this guy singing so weird? Because, you know, it was in Japanese, I'm a little white boy from Cleveland, Ohio. I didn't understand. <laughs> These what... words make no sense. Yeah, I didn't understand what if was going gonna on. If you're going to import your your TV to our country, learn English. Yeah, I, I hey, I didn't get it. Hey, you know, I've grown to love the song, but at the time, you know, I had no context for it. It made no sense to me. But as as I started listening to more and more Japanese music, I really appreciated it. But 
uh, sort of my rock history as I was becoming a teenager when I started to get into rock music was just watching a ton of VH1 Classic and just watching Metal Mania and watching Rat and Dokken and Dio videos and being exposed to a lot of those bands through just watching those videos over and over again. And there was this special on VH1 called like the 100 Worst Moments in Metal History. And Loudness was one of those moments. And they were like, these guys are a corporate manufactured band. You know, they can't even sing in English very well. No one cares about them. And that was what the show was pitching. What? Who, who cares about, like, power metal bands not being able to sing in English well? But, when has that ever been a thing? But when I watched that documentary or the list show, whatever... I thought, this band sounds awesome because they played clips of their music. Like, I don't agree with what the people on the TV are saying. This band sounds sweet. I want to check them out. Uh, eventually found them online and dived into the catalog and found that, like many of my favorite bands, they go through a bunch of different stylistic eras. They grow and evolve and change. And I fell in love with the catalog uh, basically, everything from their first album up until the first reunion album, I think, is brilliant. Once the original lineup reunited in the 90s, they got a little too heavier for my taste, lost the melody, but that's still a string of, like, 13 A-plus albums that I adore. Akira Takasaki is, by far, the best guitarist I've ever seen live and in person. The dude... The only time this has happened to me when I was at a concert and the guitar player's hand moved so fast it disappeared from sight. And I'm like, that is badass. And it was during my favorite Loudness song. I'm like, this is sweet. I'm having an awesome time. Musically, uh, also a, a, a huge influence on me. A couple Lipstick songs were inspired by this band. The, the Lipstick song Merle was inspired by me riffing around on the Loudness song Let It Go, which... Also, accidentally turned me into a Frozen fan, but that's a discussion for another episode. But <laughs> yeah, so really. That's how you got obsessed with Frozen? Is like, you like the song title Let It Go from Loudness? Basically, I saw that everyone was sharing Let It Go. I'm like, this can't be as good as the Loudness song. Checked it out, and it was pretty sweet. So yeah, <laughs> so, yeah you, can blame loud you can blame Loudness for my Frozen fandom, but Merle was uh, inspired by the. The guitar riffing was inspired by Let It Go. I learned that song and guitar and then had my own twist on it. And then the lipsticks on The Flash was inspired by the chunky rhythms and incoherent lyrics of the band. So, big musical influence on two of our better received songs. I just, I have a lot of history with this band. I, I love them. And this isn't my favorite Loudness record, but I figured it was the best one to talk about. I figured if we did Crazy Nights... Um, I think we wouldn't be able to get past the discussion of the title track. I think that would loom over the episode nah. too much. I think if I did one of the albums with Mike Viscera as the vocalist, I think that'd be cheating because he's an American singer and sort of he, you know, uh, defeats a lot of the preconceived notions of the band. It seems to come from people not liking the lyrical uh, phrasing of Minoru. So couldn't do him. And the Masaki albums, the other singer they had are really good, really heavy, but don't capture their classic sound. And then the first couple albums are really proggy, so this was really the only only option was to discuss this album. But like I said, I adore it, and I'm really looking forward to diving in and discussing this record. So, sorry for going for a bit, but I, you know, I got, I've got a lot of history with this band. I'm a big fan. Yeah, I didn't understand any of that stuff you were saying. It was essentially <laughs> Essentially as if you were speaking in Japanese, but, uh, you know, I can now say I've listened to an entire Loudness album, and uh, we'll see if that's for the better or for the worse. Yeah, and so the next time Jericho gives you shit about it, you can say, look, I listened to Disillusion, and I thought it was, and I'm leaving the pause, because we don't know yet. the blank. But yeah, you yeah got <laughs> I, I'm sure the next time I run into Jericho, that'll be the first topic of conversation will be uh, <laughs> loudness. Uh, but if it comes up, yes, I will have that ammunition, sure. <laughs> uh, he mentioned it on one of the Pot of Thunder episodes. He was saying, like, man, loudness is great. They're one of my favorite bands. So it might well, come he's, up. He's like you guys and Jeff and a lot of other people I know who are just way more into that. 80s scene than i was you know i mean i, I loved the videos for and, and obviously respect the 
guitar playing and the sort of, you know, uh, just the, the, the rocking, uh, quality of the material but i i never owned any hair metal al- i'm actually that's not true the one uh hair metal album i actually ever owned was tooth and nail by dokken you never had slippery when wet bro <laughs> no there were enough guys on the floor and when my freshman year in college had it and i heard it incessantly that i didn't need to own it and that kind of went for the, the rest of the hair metal bands it's like i never really uh, felt inspired to own anything by them because I was uh, so exposed to it, um, you know, on radio and from other people who were listening to it. So I, I was never really familiar with any of the deep cuts from any of those albums. I mean, again, I appreciated the guitar work, the tits and ass and the videos, all of that stuff. But in terms of what I would actually throw on a turntable or in a CD player to listen to. They were not on the list. So, And that's fair. Maybe the reason I love hair metal so much is that I'm pretty sure I was conceived at a Bon Jovi concert. The uh, the running joke I tell Steve is that I exist because of Bon Jovi and Bud Light. So, you know, maybe just like it's just in my blood. I just woke up, you know, I erupted from the room and started singing Lay Your Hands on Me. Well, hey. Whatever, uh, whatever works for, uh, you know, everyone involved, you know, I, I'm not one of these people who, you know, there's a lot of, uh, music elitists who dismiss hair metal as even a viable, um, music genre. I'm definitely not among those people. You know, I thought, uh, Howard Stern's speech in, uh, inducting Bon Jovi into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame was spot on. You know, it's like all these musical elitists who will only regard anything approaching Bob Dylan as viable lyrical content, and you know the people who like this music are idiots. And I, I don't subscribe to that at all. I mean, it's definitely. I mean, it, it dominated the '80s in a lot of ways. I mean, how can you dismiss that? It's just you can't. Were you guys ready to get into this ranking? I'm ready. Let's do it. All right. So, coming in as the least best song in our ranking on the Loudness album, Disillusion, we have Anthem, Loudness Overture, a.k.a. the opening cut on the English version of the album. Not on the Japanese version of this album, but only on the English version of Disillusion. So, new track they added, special for us... American and European listeners. They're like, here, here's one that you can't complain about the lyrics on. Are you happy? <laughs> or the vocal inflection. Right. Which, uh, <laughs> which to, to, to speak to Steve's point from earlier, make no mistake about it, in the, in the mid to late 80s when Thunder in the East came out, that was the running joke about these guys was the, the, the vocals and the, in, the inflections on the uh, English words and stuff and I, I'm absolutely sure that that's why they ended up on that uh, worst moments of metal list you you referenced or Greg referenced earlier um, it, you know for, for a lot of listeners if not the majority of listeners that, that was a running joke about these guys and if it prevented people like me or any of those guys from delving deeper in the catalog and there's some quality stuff there then that that's to our detriment, but uh, make no mistake, uh, these guys were, for better or for worse, uh, legitimately or otherwise, they were a bit of, bit of a laughing stock at the time. Yeah, that's kind of a, one of the reasons. Somehow the Scorpions could get away with it. Well, the Scorpions were a little bit of a joke, too, not it's as much. they were. <laughs> but, you know, that's one of the reasons I really wanted to do this episode is because I'm kind of sick of people, like, I understand those jokes in 85, but I still have friends of mine who are making those jokes in 2018. And it's like, okay, yes, that, that joke might have been funny, you know, 30 years ago. But it's not really funny now. Just listen to the music and there's some good stuff there. And I think, you know, it's unfortunate that they aren't treated as credible musicians because of it when there's just such fine playing on the record. And I think Minoru... You know, he's more of a traditional Japanese vocalist. If you listen to Japanese pop music, once you start to get into the 90s and 2000s, they start to sing a lot more like Western vocalists, and you can't notice the inflection as much. 
but he's he's very old school and i understand that's not the natural frame of reference for most western listeners but man dude has a has a killer voice his inflection might be a little bit weird but you know what it's part of the charm of the material it really it's like you know dave lee roth might not be the best vocalist but he adds a charisma and quality to those early Van Halen records that would just be solely, you know, they, they would feel incomplete without him. But back to the instrumental yeah, track. Yeah, there wouldn't be any vocals. It's, the, been, it's been 30 years since the 80s we make those jokes. So let's just get through this and we won't be uh, racist anymore. <laughs> but but, but on, on to the, the instrumental track we're talking about. So... I think this is a it's a really cool way to intro an album. I think it's got a great blend of these, you know, heavy 80s guitars, which I admit like some of those riffs at the beginning were mimicked throughout the 80s by a bunch of other bands. So stylistically, it sounds like a bunch of other stuff going on. But then it gets into the more 70s glam section with the bells going on, the Dick Wagner-esque guitar playing and just that transition and melody it sounds like something bob ezrin would have done and that to me is so fun and part of the charm of loudness is all their different layers they're not a one trick pony band that a lot of people might think of just by hearing crazy nights but there's so many different twists and turns and directions they take and that's a lot of this album is sort of a transition between their proggier stuff and their more metal stuff and this song is a nice blending of the two i i love this track a lot so wait, the 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 bouncy, more oompa-y part towards the end is the progier part. That's the progier part. It's well, it's they have other instrumental tracks on early albums that have elements of of this in it. Uh, this is less proggy than those, and more gla- more seventies glam. But it's still it's harkening back to those prog elements from the previous records. But I, it's. You know, I I know Prague isn't necessarily everyone's cup of tea, but you know, I enjoy my share of Prague bands. I like says I the like, dude who spent all morning bickering on Facebook about whether or not Rush is better than the Beatles. I mean, look, the Beatles are better than Rush, but that doesn't mean that Rush isn't in my top ten. They're just in the second half of my top ten. They're a great band. I enjoy, you know, I enjoy Rush. I enjoy some Genesis. I I enjoy my share of Prague. It's not my not my wheelhouse, not the my favorite music, but yeah, I'm not going to shit on Lamb Lies Down on Broadway. It's a great record. As a Canadian, you're wrong. Rush is better than the Beatles. D- all right. Fudge off, you fuck. <laughs> Respectfully disagree, sir. But let's let's <laughs> disrespectfully let our... disagree. Fudge let's... off, you fuck. <laughs> let's let our guests get in on on this track. Let, <laughs> what what do you guys think about the opening cut on this album, the anthem, Loudness Overture? Jeffro, you can uh, take the lead on this one. My takeaway, it reminded me of the intro to March of the Saints by Armored Saint with a lot of leprechauns. <laughs> so you mean this was awesome? That does sound yeah, like an yeah. awesome description. Do you like the scene where they present the two-foot-tall Stonehenge and Spinal Tap? You like yeah, well, here's the thing. I think Stonehenge is actually a kick-ass song. It is pretty good. Like, I wish that song was longer. It was like, oh, this is so good. I love these hooks and that keyboard riff. Yes. Yeah, I, when I, when I, that intro kind of caught me off guard. Um, you know, I was, I was kind of, uh, I wasn't expecting something so dainty like that. <laughs> it was dainty. Yeah, that's a good way I, to describe it. It sounded like it sounded like you know it was dainty. That's the best way to describe it. And uh, I was eager for it to conclude. Um, it, uh, in, in fact, we we talk about the English version versus the Japanese version. I didn't realize that this was just for the English version. And when they said English, that they really meant English, as in United Kingdom, as in Scotland, because it just reminded me of leprechauns. Well, well, you know, as far as dainty goes, I mean, I'm doing glam in 2018, and I was listening to some Jabriya on the way over here, so dainty is fine with me. I was jamming to this, but once again, this is a blending of different styles I like. I enjoy 80s metal, I enjoy 70s glam, and I enjoy the band's earlier prog stuff, so this was like, hey, all those things meet in the middle, and the... 
There is another instrumental track on the album just previous to this. I actually thought about doing that album, but I thought that that track would troll everyone else on the panel too much. Where I'm like, eh, I'm not going to do it. That It might be too dainty. <laughs> Oh, I just checked out the overall rankings. You guys hated this one. I'm I'm the only one who liked it. Yeah, Steve, you ranked it the highest of the bunch. I, I still love it. It's just, it's hard for me to rank an album where I love all these songs. That's fair. But yeah, Chris, well, how about you? It's also, I mean, it, it would have to be really a incredible instrumental to for me to rank it above any of the songs with vocals on it. So I'll start with that. I, I wouldn't necessarily say, necessarily say I hated it, but um, I don't know. I, I, you, uh, Greg mentioned some Dick Wagnerisms in there. I didn't hear any of that. Had I detected some, I probably would have liked it more, but what I heard was, um, you know, Mainly the neoclassical stuff. Uh, the Ing, I heard a lot of Ingve uh, nods and the guitar playing, um, kind of a general Scorpions vibe. Which yeah, I'm kind of lukewarm on the Scorpions. I mean, they were they were good, but um, they never really floated my boat there. Um, and then uh, just the name of the song, Anthem Loudness Overture. Uh, you can, <laughs> Actually, well, it's actually kind of confusing because during the 80s, didn't they have a big Japanese band that were these guys' uh, competition called Anthem? Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. know. In fact, they have a song called Loudness, Anthem Overture. <laughs> Anthem, know. Anthem on uh, Metal Play. I, you know, I don't know Anthem. I know EZO and I know X Japan uh, and I know Passion Rose, but I don't, I don't know Anthem. I, you need I, to check anthem you need to if you like loudness you need to check out anthem they were on metal blade all right yeah steve's looking at the wikipedia article right now uh first paragraph compares them to loudness and earthshaker oh man earthshaker's great all right yeah i'll probably like them (laughs) well there you go um but anyway what i was gonna say was the words anthem and overture in the title are nods to rush and uh, i was surprised throughout the album not necessarily in this, but as we get into some of the other tracks, I was surprised at some of the uh, the Rush influence I heard, which I guess would explain, or maybe comes from the, the more proggy albums that preceded this one. But um, uh, So you're surprised gonna... to discover that this song is actually about Ayn Rand. <laughs> Objectivism! <laughs> I will build the best trains! Yeah, you know, don't... Oh, they're Japanese, they did. (laughs) Don't give the drummer a mic, and don't let the drummer write lyrics. Those are two, you know, hard and fast rules in rock and roll. Right. Um, But yeah, I mean, it was okay, but I mean, in general, you know, it's not uh, a game-changer like Eruption, not even in the same ballpark. I mean, if the... Tooth and Nail, I referenced earlier. This kind of reminds you of Without Warning, I think is the name of that intro, guitar intro that leads off that album. It's kind of similar to that, I would say. So, I mean, it was all right, but nothing. It's, I'm not super into this brand of guitar playing in general. I mostly just really like that change up where it, where it switches to the, 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 the bouncy section. Like the first part, like, okay, yeah, it's a over-the-top riff rock, and then it just goes into this super poppy thing. I was like, all right, I'm into this. Going good places. But yeah, I, th- I think we kind of talked about everything there is in this song. There's not that much. So let's move on to the next one. Next up on the list, we have Revelation, not an instrumental. So uh, for me... This is more indicative of the loudness that became successful in the 80s. This is closer to what they did on Thunder in the East, Lightning Strikes. Like This is the direction that they would sort of become known for, just really big, chunky metal, giant gang choruses. And it's not a bad song. It's just everything else on this album does something that's more musically interesting for me that makes the song stand out more and grab me as a listener. And I still like the song a lot, but just, you know, I'm, I do glam gimmicks are great for Mm. me. 
So this song, the gimmick in this song is that it doesn't have a gimmick. And, you know, that's... It, it it makes it weaker. There's nothing that's like makes it really stand out against the others, except it sounds most like a loudness song you could throw on one of the Nets three albums without anyone noticing the difference. Yeah. So it's indicative of the sound they would take. It's still catchy. It's still fun. But I like the other stuff on the album more. I probably ranked this one lower than I should have because it uh, seems a solid middle of the road. Uh, hard rock song in this style but it kept on reminding me of Higher Ground which I know from the Red Hot Chili Peppers version so I docked at some points I was like don't sound like RHCP and then uh, I just double checked and realized that was a Stevie Wonder cover so it should probably be much higher (laughs) so wait you didn't know that was a Stevie Wonder cover no I don't listen to enough Stevie Wonder I mean, I don't listen to enough Red Hot Chili Peppers, so I didn't know they butchered that song. You listen to enough Red Hot Chili Peppers. I didn't listen to enough to know that I hate them. Right, you listen to enough of them. (laughs) Can you believe these clowns, Jeff? I mean, this is what happens when you talk to millennials. They just don't appreciate the the history involved in various things. Unbelievable. Are 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 are, Are you dressing me down for not knowing the Stevie Wonder reference, or are you upset that we that we're... Grousing on I mean, I, on I know the Stevie Wonder song. I just don't like the Chili Peppers. I just hate white people ruining funk music. Yeah, that's it's not knowing that it was a Stevie Wonder that's, cover. That's kind of I deserve that. <laughs> See, Jeff, he, he can't even form any response to this. I can tell. <laughs> just, I'm just yeah. I'm in digestion mode. How about that? He's firing up the bandsaw and ready to run your pictures through it. <laughs> repair shop. So, so Jeff, what is he next? Uh, Jeff, sure. you wanna yeah, who wants to go on? next on Revelation? I'm trying to remember which song Revelation was. I have problems uh, trying to associate song titles. It's in the one between, that kind of sounds like Higher Ground. The da, 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 da. In between the Rush sounding song and the uh, Eruption sounding song. Oh boy, that narrows it down now, doesn't <laughs> I? I feel like putting it next to the eruption sounding song does narrow it down a lot. Yeah, it's- yeah, yeah. You're talking about it. Yeah, I, I kind of share the opinion that you know it was pretty straightforward. I know with me that pretty sh- if I'm not if I'm not drawing quick conclusions that I am extremely ready to verbalize. That kind of backs up the idea that it was pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, nothing to write home about special, but, you know, not a slouch. I mean, I, I didn't really hear anything on this record that was a super slouch that had me, you know, like grabbing the fast forward, you know, button or anything. But, you know, I guess the idea that it's not jumping out at me saying, say something bad about it, you know, wasn't that bad. It's, it's not a skip, but you wouldn't have missed it if it wasn't there. You know, it's probably the least yeah. memorable cut on the album in terms of just it being hooky and catchy. And once again, I still like it, but also I have, you know, a decade of loving this album on you guys. I mean, this is, you know, one of my go-to CDs in high school. So I have, you know, 10 plus years loving this album, adoring it. And so obviously I'm going to remember the hooks of it better because I had 10 years to listen to it. You guys had a couple weeks. Ah, uh, glam rock Gle- Greg walking around his high school listening to Japanese heavy metal. Yeah. I you were really- such a nerd. <laughs> Dude, I was yeah. awesome in high school. <laughs> I had no idea Loudness had a, a glam rock heritage. So that'll tell you right there. No, oh. just Greg was called glam rock Greg. That, that was a, an, a somewhat endearing nickname that I didn't get till after high school, actually. It was a somewhat endearing nickname. <laughs> uh, keep, keep in mind that Greg also uh, contends that Lil Wayne had a glam rock here. Uh, it's, uh, he, well, he, this guy wait, can did apply. I say that? I don't think I said that. I'm, jo- I'm joking. <laughs> what I, I'm trying to illustrate I mean, but that sounds like can... the bullshit I would say, so I'm like, hold on. I know <laughs> I say guy, a lot of bullshit, I know, but I don't remember that bullshit. I know I've this heard Greg defending attach... Lil Wayne's guitar skills at one point. I never did that, <laughs> but that sounds like some bullshit I would pull. <laughs> he can attach glam rock sensibilities to anybody, so just keep that in mind when you're talking to Greg. That's <laughs> well, just how he is. I, I've, I've sort of analyzed that with people, as people tend to assign their favorite genre to their favorite music, regardless of what it actually is. Like, I'm in a psychedelic band, too, and the vocalist from that band describes 
everything that he likes as psychedelic. You know, exactly. Beck, sure, Beck is totally psychedelic. Flaming Lips, psychedelic. Uh, you know, uh, he goes back and listens Debbie to some Gibson, Thin Lizzy and is like, like oh, that's no. kind of psychedelic. I mean, but there's a lot of artists I like that I won't tie to glam. Like, I love Thin Lizzy. There is no way I can tie them to glam rock whatsoever. They're just a kick-ass rock band. I mean, the music of Jim Steinman should be called glam rock for every reason, but it isn't. But enough people don't think it is. I'm not going to fight on that one. I'm like, all right, fine, whatever. I'm not going to call Russia glam band. But I will say loudness. I would say any 80s hair band, I will tie to glam. And, you know, obviously, like... If you wear bo- spandex and tassels, yes, you're a glam band. Yeah, so I'm going to tie those to glam, and I'll tie Trickster to glam, because, yeah, they're wearing flannel, but they sound like all the hair bands, so I'm going to count that. But, yeah, Revelation, it's a song. Uh, moving on. Next on the list. Well, wait, I, I, I didn't chime in <laughs> on it All right. It the <laughs> main reason why I want to chime in on it is because it's, it's kind of cool that we're all kind of in agreement. My notes on this song were it was the absolute um least memorable of all the vocal tracks on the song um the only thing i can things i can kind of point to that were memorable is i it kind of picked up steam for me as the solo kicked in and um i detected a couple of vinnie vincent uh, isms in the solo so that was kind of cool but other than that uh, just completely unremarkable for me. Oh, man, we had uh, just on Facebook last night, one of our other guests from multiple episodes, uh, Joe from UFF, I introduced him to Vinnie Vincent for the first time, and he was in awe about how ridiculous that guy's shredding is. Vinnie Vincentisms? Yeah. It was, it was <laughs> okay. Yeah, it was pretty tremendous, like showing him Speedball Jam, like, hey, man, check out this. How much of it did he get through? I have no idea. Probably like two minutes. That's fair. All right, you guys ready for the next song on the list? All right, I'm done talking about this great song. Oh, there you go. You got the new (laughs) drop in. We're positive. Yep, bring it. All right, next up on the list, we have Exploder, a.k.a. Eruption. Yeah, except for the fact that Eruption was a bonus track on this version. We're not getting into that Eruption, which is a different song, which... Completely unrelated. Right. But yeah, this is their version that, of eruption. That, that, that gets into my what chafes my butt is, is that I'm I'm a big I'm big into song titles. You know, I think you should put some thought into your titles. Um, ideally, they should link up with the lyrics. But if they don't, come up with something cool. Um, and especially for an instrumental, you can call it whatever you want. I mean, to where's to my call, thing, Master of Boats, Part Four. <laughs> to call a guitar instrumental eruption after what came out in 1978, you just fucking can't do it. It's right? Just, you, come on now. I mean, you just, you know, it's like coming out with a power ballad. Let's call this one Bridge Over Troubled Water. That's a great idea. Let's, <laughs> uh, let's, uh, let's call it that, and nobody will, nobody will associate it with one of the greatest songs of all time. It's just, it, you can't do it. It's off limits. Yeah. There's my rant on that. Right, but you know, we're not that's from a that's from a different EP, it's not from this album. So we're not talking about er, uh eruption by loudness. We're talking about exploder by loudness. Right, but I'm, is- I'm just saying <laughs> I'm tying that back into what pissed me off about the whole crazy nights thing. Right, so. no, that's fair. But I mean, I think it is related in that, you know, some of the bonus versions of this album did feature the song called Eruption. Yeah, but that's, that's, is- from a, that's from an EP. It's like it's a separate release. So I I don't like, and this song is so blatantly trying to be Eruption. Well, see, for me, this song isn't trying so much to be Eruption. It is just, this is what, you know, it's as someone who's got the see- same structure. But th- as someone who's seen Loudness live. Yeah, he's totally right. You know, it starts with the whole band involved. And, it, it, you know, Steven's spot on here. If it didn't follow the same structure with like suddenly halfway switching through to the tapping thing, like I don't, I don't think I would have docked it as many points. But like it is, it's a cover song, and it's almost like you can tell when they titled this song. It's like, huh, let's see what what's another word for e that starts with e that we can <laughs> use to describe a uh, Van Halen esque uh, <laughs> Some, something blowing up. 
you know, give me the, where's the dictionary? <laughs> let's let's go through it here. <laughs> you know, and, Steve's right, Greg's wrong. Oh, I, so I mean, Ed, I I understand structure wise. It is basically it it is trying to be eruption. However, the defense I'll give it is that when we did the Black Sabbath episode, a lot of that episode. We talked about how that album just felt like a Black Sabbath set at the time. As someone who's seen Loudness live, this is just what the guitar solo is like. And just appreciating Akira, you know, just ripping into that guitar live. So to me, this feels less like a real track and more just like something they would do at a live show. And to me, that was fun. But yes, I admit it's it's pretty much a ripoff of Eruption. And when I think of Exploder, I keep thinking this song is called Master Exploder. But then I remember that's a Tenacious, <laughs> nope, that's D, tenacious D song D. that's way better than this. And if it has Tenac- vocals. yeah, if Tenacious D is you know if the Tenacious D song is better than your song, you're probably doing something wrong. But still, I I, I do mean unless enjoy the this. Tenacious D song is a Wonder Boy, then uh, you can't do much about that, right? Jeff, what are you, what's your take on this one? Oh, it's uh, push back from the table and look at the pig, big picture. Um, the only reason loudness fell on my radar, my peers' radar, as far as the guys that I hung out with, played music with, went to high school with, everything else, the only reason loudness even showed up on our radar is because they had this guy who was the Japanese version of Edward Van Halen. This is basically just reaffirming that marketing message which sold us you know not only introduced us to the band but made us go out and buy the record i think that if you say anything really critical about this um i I think it's out of place uh it uh, it absolutely serves the purpose uh it's intended to one of the things I thought was kind of funny, too, is the idea that when Akira defected from ESP, at least on paper, uh, the model that he plays for that company that he started, Killer Guitars, the model's called the Exploder. Did you guys know that? <laughs> I, I did not know that. I'm admittedly not much of a guitar nerd. I'm I'm a vocalist. So for me, it's yeah, all well, like, hey, how's your song structure? Did you write good pop hooks? He shows up and is like, there's a microphone for me, right? Hey, I remember yeah, the days when I had the most gear and lipstick, so you shut up. <laughs> yeah, the most gear meant the cat costume, though. The cat costume <laughs> and the merch. <laughs> yeah, well, going going back to the structure, going back to the idea of, you know, if you want to call it cloning, if you want to call it a ripoff, if you want to call it a tribute, call it what you want to. But it serves the precise purpose that it is supposed to within this band. Uh, you know, and that's why uh, I know in my personal rankings, I actually had this up like in the top three. Yeah, this is your second from the top. Mm. So you you dug this. And I mean, this is this is fucking sweet. Like if I was at a loudness show and that was the solo section, I probably wouldn't notice it was an eruption knockoff or structure wise. I would just be like, this is fucking awesome. And I would just be lost in the moment. And so looking at it from that perspective, I can't. I hate this piece. See, if they called it Eruption, I would have given it a lot more. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, you absolutely can't hate it. I mean, you know, the uh, it, it, it Akira, Akira is loudness. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that because the stuff he did without the original lab, the stuff with Viscara, the stuff he did with uh, Masaki, like those are those are great albums. They're heavy. They're unique. There's a lot of good stuff. And there are loudness albums where he is, you know, this is the classic lineup and this is the lineup that's on most of the catalog, but so many albums where he's the only guy left and those are still great records. So yes, Akira is loudness the same way that Phil Linet is Thin Lizzy. Like Akira is loudness and this is just showcasing, hey, I'm fucking sweet. Hmm. Yeah, I really, if if, if I had to be critical, if I really had to be critical on this, I really wished he would have put a little bit more time into it from a compositional standpoint, because it's like riff, 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 end of song. You know, I, 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 I get that. Once again, I, you know, to me, it's just a live solo. This is the live solo, and I dig it. So I think you know, in a live solo, in a live context, it would work a lot better if they'd called it eruption. 
I would have had a lot. I would have been a lot more forgiving of it. Or Eruption Two. I mean, just just call it a cover of Eruption, and it's sort of a reimagined cover because it's not exactly the same thing. But you know, if you're this tier of guitarist, you're not going to play exactly the same thing somebody else did because that just shows you to be a copying hack. Instead, you're going to take their ideas and you're going to reimagine them in your own way, and call that Eruption. Give Eddie Van Halen songwriting credit for it, and I would have thought this was a great song. You know, the, sort of the perfect cover is it's, it captures the important ideas of the song, but filtered through the lens of the uh, the new uh, performer. I kind of disagree with that. I think melodically, you know, structurally they're very similar, but the melodies and are way too different for me to consider them the same song. It's definitely a, a you know, a... Uh, inspired by it, but to call them the same song, I think, is a little bit too much. Yeah, I mean, what he could have done is call it um, Eruption 2 Loudness Boogaloo. (laughs) Would have been been great. That Uh, would have been better. Papa would have been for Vesuvius. (laughs) Oh, yeah, nice. There you go. Um, I mean, there's a lot of Japanese volcanoes he could have named it after, too. Could have gone local. Yeah, I mean, so far, uh, I have the these three songs that we've covered so far were in my bottom three. Um, I had this one beneath uh, Revelation simply because, you know, it's an instrumental and also heard it done better before, basically, is my attitude. Um, things I did like about it were... Um, uh, I liked, you know, uh, there, there, there were a couple of audio clams in there or, or, you know, technique clams in there that, uh, gives a, you know, kind of humanizes it and, uh, makes gives you the impression that he, he did peel it off in the studio and didn't really try to fix it up too much afterwards. <laughs> and, and then also along those lines is, you know, um, you could hear, you could hear some, uh, toward the end in one of the breaks, you could really hear some like, amp buzz which means he could tell he was playing at some some extreme volume and uh you know i I definitely appreciated that so i mean and also you know putting yourself in his shoes you're a guitar nerd you you're getting to record music for a living and you're like you know what fuck it i'm gonna do a eddie van halen style track and just have fun with it you can tell he's having fun on this track. And yeah. it's hard to knock a musician having fun on, on a song. Yeah. Like, even and, if it's not I, your thing, you're like, eh, he's, he's having fun. Good for him. And I also, that I thought Jeff made a great point about the whole marketing as a band and how this uh, probably got a lot, of, uh, a lot of people into the music knowing that this was somewhere on the album that they, and that they needed to explore it, so. I thought that was a good point. If you think of it in the marketing perspective, uh, putting it as the opening track of Side 2 was probably a really good choice. Makes oh, it yeah, easy, absolutely. Super easy to get to. So when people are like, look, I found this Japanese guy who's basically Eddie Van Halen, check it out, flips over the album, plays that first track easily. And the thing to remember is, like, at the time, Loudness were sort of a slowly rising in popularity in Europe. And so, like, the the first couple albums were coming in as imports in Europe, and were starting to get some buzz, and then this was the first one they were intentionally marketing towards an English audience. So they're like, hey, we really want to make sure you guys know we have the Japanese Eddie Van Halen, and he's fucking killer. So it, it makes sense, marketing-wise, why it's on there and where it is on the album. But yeah, you guys ready to move on to the next track, or any other comments on Exploder? No, All right, I'm, I'm done good. talking I'm... about this crappy song. Song is great. Shut the fuck up, Steve. <laughs> I did rank that one lowest, though. All right. So next up on the list, we have Ares Lament. Hmm. I think this is an awesome, awesome, awesome song. You know, admittedly, the first half of it is kind of just a typical power ballad. A typical power ballad that is sung way too high. Uh, wh- whatever I'm I don't even care about that criticism I'm just gonna bulldoze through it <laughs> the, but the thing is once it kicks into that second half with that you know sort of soccer uh vocal melody like that big soccer anthem vocal melody at the end 
the song just takes on a level of majesty and beauty where it just it transcends into this different realm of just awesome, beautiful brilliance. And I really like the song title, you know, referencing like Ares, the the god of war and you know, the someone who is supposedly so powerful but having like sensibilities and vulnerabilities. You know, a big part of the appeal of Thin Lizzy is how Phil Linet exposes a lot of his vulnerabilities through the lyrics. But when Loudness takes this mythic character and allows that mythic character to be vulnerable with this, you know, beautiful, otherworldly melody closing out the track, it makes it really epic and awesome. You know, a few years later, they re-recorded this song on one of their other albums because they thought it had hit potential. And it was the other version was was still good, but I think this one captured the raw emotion better. And it's just so, so top-notch. I just, I, I, I will say the first half of the song isn't quite as good. I still like it, but that second half just transcends to such a great place. I, I, I adore this track. It's great. I totally agree on the second half. Uh, I was saying, so my main critique with it is the vocal on the first half in that like he's singing it in that high octave and there's just too much vocal intensity for what's happening with the rest of the track and it doesn't build the way it should. But if he sang that first half down an octave and then jumped up for the second half with all those proggy change-ups, this would be an amazing song. But as it is, it's just a pretty okay one. I don't know. I, I really love his vocals on the entire track. I think the the other version, which they titled So Lonely for the English uh, release later on, on um, Hurricane Eyes, he sings the entire song really intense, and the vocals are just super overproduced on that track. Mm. And so it's just like layers and layers of vocals, and it's too much. For me, this is this is perfect because, you know, I'm... When it comes down to it, an old school meat and potatoes, seventies classic rock guy. And so that's meat closer. Yeah, meat and potatoes, man. <laughs> so like stylistically, production wise, that's a little bit closer to it and the so lonely version just eighties overproduced, which I still like that style, but like, to me it works so much better in this context and you know, I'm just gonna keep gushing over it. Someone else go. Jeff, you want to take this one? Yeah, um, I, I'll i be the first to admit that I really didn't know too much about Loudness's uh, pro, you know, prog rock background. I was pretty much introduced to him with Thunder in the East, and uh, I, I hadn't heard anything off of this album or anything before, but I, I had made reference to, some, to one of you guys earlier about the idea that I'm, you know, when I, when I want to hear Loudness, you know, I want to hear hear akira and i want to hear three and a half minutes of swift kicks to the nuts with a full <laughs> st- i don't want to hear i don't want to hear them performing a b-side or something that fell on the editing floor when hemispheres or a farewell to kings was recorded <laughs> you know that's not loudness the name of the band is loudness loud loud it's true but the th- you, you know, know when you know, like I said, I want I want groin kicks. I don't want texture. I don't want meaningful lyrics. I want <laughs> See you in Tokyo, bitch. What? That's not what I hit. <laughs> I need some balls. <laughs> That's the drop you wanted. Yep. Uh, I got one for that too. Find the drop, Steve. <laughs> the 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 thing is like I'm a guy who likes diversity in my catalogs, so I like a lot of the Kiss stuff that a lot of Kiss fans think is kind of shitty. My favorite Kiss album is The Elder. I, I like the weird poppy stuff like Tomorrow off Unmasked. Like, I like diversity of catalog. To me, that's very fun. And, you know, the, the first album, which has a song called Loudness, mm. is kind of just like a bouncy Deep Purple song. So, like, it's part of the band's heritage. I like them paying homage to their influences when they do the Rush-esque stuff. But for me, the big fun of a band like Loudness is all the twists and turns in their catalog. If all their stuff sounded like Thunder in the East, th- sorry, Thunder in the East, I, I wouldn't care as much. They wouldn't be in my top ten. I would find them to be, you know, all right, solid, but it, they wouldn't be elevated to that next level. For a band to enter into my top 10 
like pretty consistently looking at their the catalogs of the bands that are in my top 10 there's diversity of catalog there's growing and evolving and changes and this song is a different texture to what they do but it still sounds like loudness at its core and so I've, I I love the track, but I, I noticed you ranked it at the bottom, so obviously there's a little <laughs> bit of discrepancy between our opinions. I th- there's, a, there's a place um, for both, right? You can, you can, oh, sorry. In the catalog, I can appreciate diversity in a catalog, but then again, I don't want to see ACDC cover till Tuesday. Right, exactly. <laughs> oh, but also that's kind of one of the reasons why ACDC isn't in my top 10 is that if you've heard one ACDC album, you've kind of heard all the ACDC albums. And I still love them, and I know the entire catalog, and I'm like, yeah, Girls Got Rhythm is great, but I, I, I want a little bit more, at least from my favorite bands. Yeah, well, maybe, you know, maybe if I walked into loudness saying to myself, I want to appreciate the diversity, I would. But, but you wanted I loudness. loudness. Like I said, I want to get kicked in the nuts with a half stack. <laughs> <laughs> and hey, I, I, I got to respect that. I got to respect that. Poison ass pentatonics. I want to hear a searing Mesa boogie. I don't even know what that guy's singing about half the time, and it has nothing to do with his accent. <laughs> it has everything to do with me not caring. I just want my yeah. testicles destroyed with and, and sound. My, and the vocals being pretty low in the mix, actually. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty funny. It's great how this uh, discussion is unfolding because I was <laughs> um, I was actually going to say the same type thing. It's like. You know, uh, you know, I love, I like my ACDC style bands that just give you exactly what you expect from track to track. I also have uh, appreciation for bands that mix it up. Um, for this one, um, you know, I appreciate uh, what they're trying to do. I, I think I, I like to hear bands kind of stretch out and take a few chances in here. Um, Generally, though, uh, I'm on board with Steve and that the vocals were kind of cringeworthy uh, in too many spots throughout the song. And, um, you know, musically, there are some good moments. I did like how they the, how they kind of ended it and what they were doing as it faded out. So it was pretty good. But overall, it was just I'm with Steve. The, the vocals kind of uh, kind of torpedoed it for me. All right, moving on. Next up on the list, we have Butterfly, which some of us uh, put as burning on our lists. But this this song is called Butterfly, a.k.a. the Rush song on this album. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> Ma- yeah. What? Man, the song sounds like Rush. And the thing is, there's multiple loudness songs. Like, if you go back to those early albums... There's a lot more that sounds like Rush. I was hanging out with my friend and his dad, and his dad is a huge Rush fan, and we were listening to the third Loudness Records. Like, is this just a Japanese Rush? <laughs> but, but so, for me, this was this was nice because they were still keeping a bit of that sound on this album as they were transitioning into what they were going to become famous for, but this is showcasing how great of players the entire band is. You know, everyone always just talks about Akira, but just everyone is is killing it masayoshi on the bass just very getty lee-esque bass lines yep uh, munetaka on the drums some neo pure s drum drumming like they're all just they're firing on all cylinders and giving you a fun prog song interesting bass tone uh you know nice lyrics uh very respectful of women uh, how women are beautiful like butterflies so not necessarily you know dick wagon <laughs> rock and roll but you know nerdy prog about how a woman is like a butterfly but a woman guess, is like a butterfly who is on fire I, but you know i Wait, why did it have two titles i it, to my knowledge it was just called butterfly uh, the the cd you gave me said burning it says butterfly on the back i'm looking at it now steve why did i write burning when i ripped it into winamp then because you probably weren't paying attention steve doesn't make any sense how I could have confused those two words. But you did. Anyway, butterfly. <laughs> it's it's a it's a great song. I will say, admittedly, I probably ranked it a little bit higher on my list because I enjoy the diversity of the track. I, I like that it's a change of pace. So in the context of the album, I like how it gives that different layer and it's not just power metal song after power metal song. 
Yeah, but I, I, I dig the tune. I like Rush a lot. I like Rush more than Loudness. So, hey, it's the song that reminds me of Rush. Yeah, I uh, had the same same uh, takeaway. Um, I had a, it's true of a couple of uh, songs here, because I'd never heard this album before, so I had to uh, write my uh, notes down. Um, but, yeah, definitely had a major Rush vibe to it. Um, I, uh, I thought I had good energy to it, and a lot of the transitions were pretty cool. And, um, you know, we'll get more into Akira's tones as we continue to talk about the album, but I really liked a lot of the cleanish tones. He's definitely known for his overdriven tones, um, but I like the clean sounds here. Uh, I just thought in general they tried to get a little too ambitious with it but uh in general i thought it was pretty cool but yeah definitely major rush vibe to this one steve as our token canadian <laughs> on right. this episode how do you feel uh i'm a little surprised at how middling i have this in the rank like i i enjoyed it a lot um i think the the vocals threw me off a little bit like, because you're expecting high-pitched getty lee and right. instead you're getting like, japanese uh, minoru nihara singing a rush song yeah so what i described this as is this song sounds like for whatever reason after he left halloween michael kisk joined rush uh, <laughs> which just i think i i knocked it to the middle in the ranking instead of way at the top just because my brain can't process that it is <laughs> such an incoherent concept but i'm pretty sure if it happened i would i would love it yeah, I mean, this admittedly is a blending of three different things that, you know, Greg loves in a song. <laughs> like, I really love hair metal, and I really love Prague, and I really love weird Japanese vocals. I wish there was a song that had all three of them in it. Oh, oh wait, loudness! Jeff, what's your take on this guy? Oh, well, I was, I, I, well, going back to me, everything Akira, you know, my first thought listening to it was like, okay, maybe he's not content with the Eddie Van Halen comparisons. Now he wants to be compared with Alex Leifson meets Andy Summers. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like everywhere you say, hey, it's like, hey, check me out. I can, in addition to doing these lightning fast double picked pentatonics, I'm going to throw some suspended seconds at him. My, yeah, my takeaway though, my takeaway on this one was the idea. Yeah, it was it was a little too rush, and I'm and I'm a big rush fan. My favorite my favorite rush albums are Permanent Waves, Hemisphere, Farewell to Kings, Twenty One Twelve, that era. And so you know, I love this style of song. I uh, you know I just it it felt weird. Uh, this type of song being placed with that band. I was thinking to myself, man, it's funny as heck that uh. You know, their singer can actually hit something somewhat Getty Lee-esque because of where his voice falls timber-wise. And it's like, okay, cool, do it. And, you know, something that Steve has talked about on some of our KISS episodes is how bands in their early days tend to just be more open about wearing their influences on their sleeve. Yep. Uh, so Steve has said, oh, this KISS song sounds like a Deep Purple song, or this KISS song sounds like Zeppelin, or whatever. And so, hey, they're just... You know, they're wearing their influence on their sleeve, having fun, and I just... The musicianship on this track is just so fun. Just everyone's firing on all cylinders, and it's really showcasing loudness as a band, not just Akira, who who is great. I mean, he is the band, but those other guys are no slouches. Like, they're all just knocking it out of the park on this track. Akira and the hired guns, who are very good at it. Well, I mean, these guys weren't hired guns at the time. Like they were his band, and this lineup lasted for a while. And if I, if I may say something about about uh, the bass player and the drummer, part of the reason that I don't really say too much about them is they are so damn tight and such a perfect fit for everything that this band does. And just the idea that they are so transparent and such such silent yet powerful contributors i think that that right there is insanely commendable yeah and admittedly uh masayoshi i think also has written some songs for the band so it's not like he's not contributing at all but like yeah they're so great it's it's the same that uh munetaka died a few years back because he's just was such a phenomenal great musician and otherwise they have the this lineup minus the drummer because 
you know, of death is still active and is the current loudness lineup. But it, it, once again, just really great players. Can't, I can't knock any of the performances on this record. They're knocking it out of the park. Any other thoughts on Butterfly before we move on? Yeah, I, I prefer it called Burning. So <laughs> that's, uh, I'm sticking with that. Fair enough. <laughs> no, I, I like tried. Women, women, women are beautiful, but some can give you a burning sensation. <laughs> Uh, you know, on the off chance my wife ends up listening to one of these episodes, I'm not going to get into this discussion about previous yeah. exploits of mine. She is, she is well, we, totally, we don't want to hear it either. She, so. she is all about being an hour deep into the loudness episode. That exactly sounds like her wheelhouse. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm so glad Mrs. Troyan does not listen to any of these episodes. I would be in so much trouble. <laughs> like, you said this on the internet. Like, yeah, babe, I did. <laughs> you said swears on the internet. This isn't the Snake Vomit podcast, Greg. <laughs> All right, next up on the list, we have Satisfaction Guaranteed. This one was second from the bottom for me. If, you know, we're talking about how you hear other bands do the same thing, but better. This was, you've got another thing coming, but Loudness doing it not quite as good, which ordinarily isn't as much of an issue for me musically. I, I'm totally fine with bands borrowing and copying from each other as long as the new song is still good and it's still a good song there's just other stuff on the album i like better but you know it's loudness doing judas priest and it's something that loudness continued to do for a couple albums they really got into the judas priest vibe cool song but not one of my favorites off the album this one was one of the easier ones to rank towards the bottom simply because i i had my top tier songs that i knew were at the very top and then I had my couple at the bottom. Like, yeah, okay, those those are like definitely the lower tier. Uh, and so this was one of the ones easier for me to rank. I don't really go for just the like the chug 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 chug. Yeah, I guess the Judas Priest guitar. I didn't make that connection, but it was kind of a boring riff. I thought so. I, I put this one third from the bottom. And even though you put it third from the bottom, I still like it more than you. Even though I ranked it lower, like I still love this song. It's just. I, lo- I love the other stuff more. My other children are better than this child. <laughs> <laughs> Sophie's choice isn't all that hard if you really think about it. Right. Jeff, what's your take? I'll tell you exactly what my take is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear Judas Priest. I didn't hear Judas Priest at all. I heard Wasp, and if Blackie Lawless would have sung this, it would have been our favorite song. Uh, I don't know. Wasp has way better songs than, than this one. I, I enjoy Loudness as a band overall, but I, even with, I, I'm, I'm, I'm picturing like what Blackie would do with the melody, but I think just composition wise, there, there wasn't much saving for this song to be have. It is a solid rock song. For me, it's a middle of the road, solid rock song. I still enjoy it. I still turn it up when it comes on, but you know, it's if you're going to compare it to something like Wild Child or anything like that, it's not even close. I just, uh, yeah, well, I was just talking about, you know, the general Wasp catalog, which you basically described with everything you said before you <laughs> cited. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, they do have a lot of middling uh, stuff. So maybe in the grander Wasp catalog, yes, this would be one of the shining stars. <laughs> But, like, I mean, I want to be somebody. I mean, even stuff like Babylon is Burning, some of their more recent stuff is really solid. So I, I, I wouldn't put this up there with a, the better Wasp song. Really good yeah. for a Wasp song? Sounds well, like guess- damning with the faintest of praise. <laughs> I mean, yes, Wasp I guess- is cool. Crimson Idol, I- brah. <laughs> I can understand where you guys are coming from, and I kind of agree on the idea. You know, pretty straightforward, middle of the road. Um, I, I liked it better than the prog stuff. Yeah, I mean, I I had this one second from the top. I, I really liked it. Um, I got another Rush vibe from the kind of spacey intro. And, you know, um, if you're going to mimic a band from around that time, there's nothing wrong with mim- mimicking Priest. Even in, And I contend that Kiss was tra- doing it um, in the non-makeup era. And, uh, you know, I like the aggression of it. And I thought this was the best drum performance on the album um which uh you know um not necessarily a fan of drummers i think in general they're psychos they hit <laughs> things for a living 
Uh, if you've ever been a most, well, if you've been in a band, you've been in a band with a drummer, uh, 99% of the time, they're going to be the biggest shit heel in the band. And, uh, <laughs> that's just how it is. But if your drummer sucks, your band sucks. That's Very another true. unfortunate rule of rock and roll music. Ninety nine percent of the time, your drummer is a shit heel. The other ninety nine percent of the time, they're very high. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, you know. <laughs> or looking at the yeah, most can't argue with that either. terrible but, uh, pornography you've ever seen. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, we could go on and on about that. But, I feel like there's um, a story I, I there the, that. Uh... <laughs> oh, there's a story. It's somewhere in my podcast. I won't relate it here, but. Um, <laughs> And, and fairness, I've had drummers drum who have done that too. They're sickos. Yeah. Drummers are sickos. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I do have and a drummer who's in prison for again, that Again, kind of they, they hit things for a living. That's all you really need to know. But <laughs> the best drum performance on the album and um, the great production on the drums. The snare sounded great. I like the aggression. And uh, I had it second from the top. Um, so there you go. Uh, any other comments on this song before moving on? No. All right, so next up on the list is my favorite song from the album, and I think this is the best drum performance on the album by a wide margin. Esper. This song is my fucking shit. Like, this is just a badass, kick-ass, awesome song. Like, I'm, I'm going to just run you through, like, my, my mental state going through the song. You, you hear the song, you got this really, like, you know, fast, up-tempo drums, and it's, like, kind of punky. Like, whoa, they're doing kind of a punky thing. And then you get this riff, which sounds just like a stupid shred lead. And then you realize that's actually the riff and the hook of the song. It's not just him shredding. That's the hook. Like, and, and then you get the verses, which are admittedly just basically a punk song. But you get to that chorus, and Minoru is just singing with such aggression and vigor. He sounds pissed off. It's the best vocal on the album. And then those fucking drum fills are just otherworldly. Just this song gets me pumped. <laughs> like this is this yeah, is, this is amazing workout music. Like I would agree awesome. with you about, about the vocals for sure. I mean, anybody who's gonna rip on this guy for the rock and roll crazy nights give this tune a listen it'll change your opinion um you know definitely did that for me um also agree with you on the tempo uh i thought it was great high energy so i i, I like that about the tune um riffs were good in terms of like uh shred as a riff that doesn't really compute with me uh, <laughs> I, I like my riffs to be less busy than that but, but what, uh, what i like about general, it I, I get what you're saying like that normally doesn't work but shred as a riff it, like he makes it into a hook and that to me is so fascinating like that's that's yeah. it's 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 so off the wall and bonkers that's something vinnie vincent would do yeah, it's definitely interesting, and uh, it's just it, it was a little off-putting for me. But I think if I were to delve into this a little more, I might come to appreciate it more. But on first listen, it was a little off-putting. But in general, I, I thought it was good. I had it at five, so right in the middle. But um, like I said, I agree with you on the vocal. I mean, this guy uh, sort of uh, vindicates himself. Not that he needs to, with a bunch of racist Americans making some <laughs> of his uh, vocal inflections. But if that's the criticism, give this tune a listen, and you'll likely change your tune about the guy I did. Preemptively, before we get to Steve's criticism, this song is catchy as hell, dude, and you're wrong. That is a catchy <laughs> chorus. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I disagree. Uh I think I felt like they were trying to rock a little bit too hard, and the no such thing. The, I, I mean, yeah, there is no such thing as rocking too hard. There is such thing as trying to rock too hard. There is no. They're not, dude. They're just kicking ass. There's no trying to rock too hard. This is just awesome, dude. It's up tempo punk esque. You should love that shit. You've got over the top technical playing, and you've got an aggressive kick-ass vocal this song is everything i mean yeah i think you know it was, it was, it was and they're fun. singing about weird people with psychic powers it's fucking metal bro <laughs> i am into weird people with psychic powers yeah this is but awesome i think shit. just like the the melody got lost in everything they were doing here 
I, I will give you the melody during the verses gets a little lost, but during that chorus, absolutely not. That's an A-plus chorus for me. That is fantastic musical perfection. I mean, yeah, the, the chorus is mostly just him singing Esper uh, a couple well, times. Well, no, that, you know, never-ending fire bit. Like, that's that's catchy, and there's such aggression and, and vigor. The song's fucking great. Jeff, what do you think of this? Well, my reflection on it, and we'll go back to the idea. Uh, anytime I talk about loudness, I'm going to make reference to that marketing scene. And I listen to this song, and I think to myself, you know, they, they were already putting out the idea that Akira is this Japanese Van Halen, Eddie Van Halen. And it was almost like this song was almost like a, we're going to prove to you that it's more than just Akira. The three of us can not only keep up, but, man, we can go to town, too. Yeah, once again, like, everyone's firing on all cylinders. Like, the drumming, I haven't mentioned the bass playing on this track, but, man, is he, is Masayoshi killing it. Like, all of them. This is loudness as a band, in their prime, firing on all cylinders. Like, this this song is just fucking sweet. This, this was my go-to song when, you know, putting on the CD in high school. You know, I would skip right to Esper, then listen to the entire album, then listen to Esper like three times in a row, then listen to the entire album. This song's fucking sweet. I love this song. Man, you must have been annoying to hang around with. <laughs> no, this is like in the headphones, dude. Re- rest assured, he never got laid. So <laughs> let's just put that out there. Uh, state the obvious, if you will, for the record. I, I, I did well in high school. I'll, I'll leave it at that in case my wife ends up <laughs> listening to this episode. How, how, how is that possible if you're geeking out on loudness he was a How short was dude possible? who was he was listening had, to a ton of hair metal in the early 2000s l- you long hair and a leather jacket goes a long way <laughs> well and that and the fact that everybody knows that short guys have huge tools so i mean you you, you strictly you got laid strictly for the curiosity <laughs> of it which whatever you got laid <laughs> you know it's hey look you gotta eat when you can right yeah, I'm not, I'm not. I would never impugn anyone for getting away. Well, I, actually, I, w- you know, I will say this. It wasn't because of your musical taste. I will say this. As soon as they found out my musical taste, that's when they didn't want to sleep with me anymore. So they would, they would think, "Oh, that guy's the cool rocker guy." And like, what's all this Japanese metal? So it's yeah. like one lay, and then they look at all the Bonnie Tyler <laughs> records, and then they're out. Well, it uh, <laughs> you know lends itself to variety, which is a good thing. Yeah, so there you go. As long as you live in a, you know, go to a school that's large enough that uh, rumors don't get around too quickly. No, the rumor that I had a huge cock was one of the best rumors that happened to me in high school, dude. That is, <laughs> oh. that was, that was great. Like the, the day don't after, special. you're a fucking short guy. Everybody assumes this about short. But guys. no, the day after it was like confirmed and everyone started talking about it, I got high fives from the entire school. It was a pretty yeah. awesome day. Yeah, I mean, that's better. It's certainly better than having the opposite said about you. <laughs> right. I'm just picturing, you know, like... I know like anything the, about that, but whatever. I'm just picturing <laughs> the girls in Greg's school walking around and be like, look, this Greg kid, he's got a huge dick, but terrible taste in music. <laughs> he's going to make you listen to Total Eclipse of the Heart. And yeah, fucking great you know, song! He wants to make chick, love to Parasite, Paradise by the Dashboard Lights. Fuck yeah, I do. The song's fucking great. The chicks in high school will hear the first part about about that, the first half of that statement. The rest of it will be like the teacher in Charlie Brown. They ain't going <laughs> to understand any of it. And then they have to find out for themselves the hard way, and then Greg's out. But, you know, again, if the, ultimately, he's getting laid. And yeah, I mean, you know, I got laid, and ultimately, I'm married to a woman who doesn't like most of my music, but, you know, she's... She just lets me listen to it when she's not around. She'll, she'll wear earplugs. Yeah, she'll wear earplugs when I put on Loudness and Megadeth. It all worked out in the end. It's a happy there ending for everybody. Win-win. <laughs> uh, any other thoughts on Esper or my high school sex life before we move on? <laughs> I, think we've, I think we've covered both those topics. Uh, the second one especially more than was necessary. So. <laughs> Jeff, we didn't get your comments on uh, Greg's high school sex life. <laughs> I wasn't around for it, man. <laughs> See, listen to it. He's he's so disinterested. He's the voice is all distorted. It is like, in fact, he's been possessed by the devil <laughs> at the very thought of this topic. So we better move on as quickly as possible. That's that's fair. <laughs> all right. Uh, I feel like I should, as a nerd, 
mentioned uh, the espers from Final Fantasy VI. That was my first introduction to the word. So when I heard this, like, yes, Final Fantasy VI song. So adding to the weird nerd getting laid dichotomy. But next up on the list, we have Crazy Doctor. This was the the big single off the album, the song that creeps up in all the loudness set lists. So, but the, the, you know, the concert staple of the album is this track. And, you know, there's a little bit of concert fatigue from it for me, which I know is funny when talking about loudness. But I always thought this song was just okay. I didn't think it was the big standout cut from the album. I liked Esper and Milky Way more than it. I still thought it was a cool tune, still like it. Uh, revisiting this album for this podcast, I, I like it a lot more, just the you know time away from the track. Especially that solo breakdown. The the neoclassical Ingve thing, it's it's really exactly, it really highlights exactly what I had in my notes, the, the neoclassical uh, lead break. So yeah. I, I, I'm really enjoying this uh, discussion just because it's it's an album that Jeff and I had never heard before, and it, it just our takeaways all seem to be lining up. So that's pretty cool, I think. So anyway, sorry to interrupt. Oh no, that, that's good. I um, talk too much anyway. So any more interruptions of you are probably a good thing. Yeah, inter- interrupt me as much as possible because I'm just like, hey, this is great. This is great. Isn't this awesome, guys? <laughs> but hey, it's it's a cool rock song. Cool rock songs yeah. are awesome. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah and for me this had the best groove of any song on the album you know i think you know everybody's got their own definition of it but it's like uh i don't know for me to to get a groove of a song resonating with me the tempo needs to be a little bit slower and a little more have a little more swagger to it and this one definitely has it um and i thought the ending was really cool so uh yeah i thought that I thought it was all right. I had it uh, number four out of ten, so uh, higher, high, the the top half, if you will. Yeah, and Jeff, does, Steve, and Jeff had it at the top. Yeah, at the top. Wow, I had it at the top from the idea that it reminded me the most of Thunder in the East. Yeah, I mean, it's the song that's closest to that classic loudness sound that pe- when people think of loudness, this is the song that's closest to that style. And this song, if you put on Thunder in the East, it would th- fit in. It was a concert staple for a reason. It fits in with that sound. Exactly. Yeah, that, I think that's part of the reason why I bonded with the uh, the song the most. And I will I will hold the rest of my comments on this song and start summarizing the record as a whole at the end. All, All right. right. Yeah, I ranked this one at the top just because, like, this was the after that anthem played this one came on and i was like all right we're in for a halloween album here i am into this and generally that's what was delivered all right uh any other thoughts on crazy doctor nope all right moving right along we're at the number two song in the ranking next up on the list we have dream fantasy so i will be the first to admit that's kind of a stupid song title (laughs) But this song is fucking awesome! I mean, just like the the aggression of this one. Like, it's just, this is straight up, like, it starts off as a thrash metal song. And it's it's just, it's so stinking heavy throughout those verses. But then the chorus is so melodic and has that level of majesty. It's not quite as magnificent as Ares Lament, but it's it's comparable to that. And it's 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 stupidly heavy during the verses and stupidly pretty and catchy during the chorus. So I'm just all about this song fucking smokes. And this is the one I think benefits the most from sequencing right after it's exploder going into this where it's just like, hey, loudness is a kick ass rock band. And this is a kick ass song like this track smokes. No, I mean. <laughs> I, these last three, um, the top three, uh, you know, I've seen the, the rankings, plus I'm able to, you know, process of elimination. I'm not going to have too much to say about them because they all sort of, they fall into that area of, like, this is good power metal. And 
Good power metal, like good ska and good pop punk, is one of those genres where all the best songs kind of sound like the same thing, but it's a really good song, so you don't begrudge it that. Well, I think this one is the heaviest of the top three. I've only had, I've only been able to listen to it three times, so I can't really like minutely cut it down. Just it's, you know, it's a good power metal song. Yeah. But it's, you know, I would say if you want to differentiate it from the other cuts in this album, it's the thrashiest song. It's the heaviest song, but it also has maybe the most melodic chorus on the album. And so that's a really interesting combination that it's simultaneously the heaviest song and the most melodic. That is a very interesting combo. But yeah, this song fucking rules, man. (laughs) Jeff, do you agree? Yeah, I kind of liked it. It was it was almost, uh, I know with me, it was little parts of it uh, were kind of like foreshadowing to uh, Black Star Oblivion off of uh, Lightning Strikes. Yeah, a, a little bit. Black Star Oblivion is like the slow, less good version of this song. <laughs> well, you know, exactly. So this is like, man, what if they played Black Star Oblivion right? Like, pick up the pace, guys. Kick some ass. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I thought it was pretty cool. I mean, you know, like I said, yeah, I can agree with the idea. Very fast, yet very melodic. I liked I liked what was going on with it. Um, everybody was doing their part very well individually. The bass playing on this track, man. The bass playing. So good. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, let's see here. Uh... Dream fantasy, yeah. I, I, I tended to like the album, uh, the songs on uh, on the second half of this album better than the first. I had this ranked at uh, number three. I uh, love the energy, great riffs, um, nice transitions. You know, there's a lot of uh, dynamics and different things going on. And uh, thought the solo was cool. Ventured a little too far into Ingve territory. But um, in general, I thought it was pretty good. I had it as my third favorite song on the on the album. I would say the first half of the solo actually maybe ventured a little bit too much into Rush territory for me. That was a very <laughs> Alex uh, Leifson uh, solo at the beginning of it. And Alex Leifson solo, you mean playing just enough to uh, support the real powerhouses of the band? Yeah, pretty much. Well, there you go. But if just... It, the, you know, mixing, like, 80s Rush with thrash metal is a combination that I d- does not normally compute in my brain. But somehow Loudness did it. And that is one of the reasons I adore this band, is weird shit like that. Like, this combination should not work, but it does. I could picture Rush doing a song called Raining Blood. <laughs> It would be, uh, you know, about their favorite uh, Robert Heinlein book. That's the cricket drop. Well. I I understood that reference. You did. No one else did. (laughs) Look, I already used the, uh, you know, Rush Writes Songs about Ayn Rand uh, joke. This podcast had to go with the the other objectivist sci-fi author. I didn't even know there was one. I I, I just kind of blank out when discussions of Neil Peart's lyrics come up. (laughs) I mean, that's probably for the best. Yeah, I mean, it is what it is. What are you going to say? All right, well, before we get to the number one song on this album, let's go through the ranking again from bottom to the top. Anthem, Loudness Overture. Revelation. Exploder. Ares Lament, Butterfly, Satisfaction Guaranteed, Esper, Crazy Doctor, Dream Fantasy, and the best song on Loudness Disillusion, according to this panel, Milky Way. This was my number two. This is my other go-to skip song on the album. Man, this, it's... A, such a creative song. Just the, the the weird vocal panning during the chorus, which is very catchy. Great riffs. It's it's heavy, melodic, 
but also as a very like cosmic ethereal thing going on uh it's it's just a really cool song. I feel like I'm traveling through outer space while listening to this song. This is a nerdy song. This is a Japanese metal band singing about space travel, but you know what? Fuck it. It's catchy. I'm all in. This is a great tune. And I'm glad it ranked so high. You know, Esper, Esper wins my heart as my favorite cut on this album, but this is... It's a close second, and I have adored this song for years. It was always a song that stood out on the record. Just very catchy, very fun, and showcasing that the band could write some really catchy, interesting songs that aren't just, you know, generic metal. Like, you, there, there's diversity to the way they compose a piece. Can you use the word catchy a few more times in your description, Greg? I don't think we're, there were quite... I was arguing about the Beatles all day, dude. I'm just... Catchy is my word of the day. <laughs> Secret word of the day. Ah! I like I like pop music, dude. Pop's great. Fair enough. Steve, what did you think of Milky Way? Again, as the, the top three on this one, I put this one, uh, I think, third of those three, but really it's a, a solidly well-done power metal song, and there's nothing really bad to say about that. It's they, they set out to do what they set out to do, and with those three songs, they accomplished it, and it sounds good. Oh, I'm curious to uh, get the thoughts on Chris and, and Jeff with this song ranking as the number one on the album. Because this is this is a deep cut. This isn't a concert staple of the band. This is pretty firmly in the deep cut category for loudness. Jeff, you want to go first? Well, I mean, I I, I don't want to say that... I, I don't want to say that I... Uh, it, it didn't really stand out to me. I, it, it, it showed up in midway in my listing. I don't know if maybe it didn't stand out to me uh, from the idea that it's a really good song and it's comparable that, to stuff that I heard on later Loudness albums. Maybe that's why it didn't jump out. Uh, which, in that in that context, I think it's really good. Um, but it showed up in the middle of my personal listings, but I don't have a problem that it came out, uh, uh, you know, tops in the list. I, I, think it, I think it's justified being there. Yeah, this was actually my number one. Uh, I thought uh, the the opening riff is the ballsiest riff by far to my ears on the whole album, and just that just drew me in from the get go. And I just uh, I, I liked the uh, transitions throughout the song, and just uh, overall, just uh, great performances by everybody. I just think everything came together on this one for me, and it just grabbed me from the right out of the starting gate and so that uh put it at the top for me yeah i mean it's it's a great riff like that is if you're looking for some rock and roll swagger that's the riff yeah. on this album but right. by and a wide margin and that's what i prefer and again when i you know i hear that it, it resonates with me instantly and uh gets high marks for me for that in fact the highest marks on the whole album for me so what did you guys think about our ranking? Were you guys surprised with it, happy with it? And what were your thoughts on the album as a whole? I know, Jeff, you were saying you wanted to give your thoughts on this album as a whole. So let's go around the panel, start with Jeff, go to Chris, go to Steve, and close. I, I don't think we need to hear my thoughts. You guys know I love it. So you guys just talk. All right. I'll tell you the biggest, the biggest takeaway that I got from this album is that after Akira, the most valuable player in loudness is Max Norman. Hey, so you're there saying you you're saying that they uh, got better as as the production increased, the band got better. So you think this is them not quite getting all the way? Absolutely, unequivocally, without doubt, <laughs> this is a good record. This is a good record, but it is it is a scrotum compared to Thunder in the East or Lightning Strike. <laughs> And I uh, typically that would be a compliment in my world. So I'm a little, <laughs> this I'm a little is a confused by I the, love it. I'm a little confused by the choice of words, but I, I I hear what he's trying to say. But like I said, in my world, that's like uh, that's high praise. <laughs> 
I just, but, I really, you know, it's a good record and everything, but what I heard, what I heard was a team with no coach. I heard a team with no guidance or at least limited guidance. I heard a lot of, it was almost like a sniper without a scope on the gun. You know, I, you I, I get that because I, when I was in high school, you know, I listened to Disillusion and Thunder to the East often back to back. And so I would be driving with my grandpa and uh, he would hear both those albums and he really liked Thunder in the East and thought it was a great record. And he thought Disillusion was terrible. And like, to me, they sounded very similar, but I get that Thunder in the East, it's a lot more of a commercial record. It's slick production. The songs are popular. They cut out a lot of their prog elements. And the songs, are, songs aren't as diverse as on Thunder in the East. So it's a cohesive package. There is a lot more continuity. There is more continuity. It is heavier. It's a heavier album. So Yeah, I, I, think, I, I think they're better records, period. And I think a lot of it has to do with the idea, okay, let's look at what the uncommon denominator was between Disillusion and then Thunder in the East and Lightning Strike. What was the uncommon denominator? The presence of Max Norman. But, you know, I, I give them a lot of credit. I mean, this is their first time doing an album in English. It, you know, their sound is evolving. I think Max Norman did take them to that Nets level commercially. But I, I don't think the gap is as wide. For me, it's like this album is dressed to kill. And then Thunder in the East is maybe rock and roll over. Where, yes, rock and roll over is definitely better than Dress to Kill, but that's because the material is better and the production, you know, the band had more time to learn, you know, and had a better producer. But I don't, I don't think the gap is that wide between the two. I think they're much closer. I mean, Chris, what did you think about the album overall as a whole? Um, I thought it was interesting. And like I said, um, you know, I heard um, a lot of influences I wasn't expecting so much, mainly the Rush uh influences um a little too much of the neoclassical thing for me it's not really my bag and i mean i can respect it obviously you know ingve just was one of those rarefied air of guys who turned the guitar world on their ear you know eddie van halen randy rhodes ingve are the holy trinity of that uh it's the 70s switched into 80s um, but, um, the thing about as a guitar player, the thing I always came to understand and respect about Akira Takasaki, and I think this is what Jeff is kind of getting at a little bit, maybe with the production thing, which, you know, we all know production is hugely important and can really, uh, take a band to the next level, not just sonically, but in terms of, you know, tightening up songs, focusing the band on a, on a, direction that's going to draw people in and keep them there for the duration of an album but the thing about akira is that you know there's no question about especially once thunder in the east came into play the guy had probably well in my opinion had the one of the top three 80s if you want to use the term hair metal as it applies to this fine but in terms of 80s hard rock metal guitar tones his is in the top three for me mainly the rhythm tone i mean that's just a crushing saturated yet clear hard rock tone just awesome uh the other two would be uh and a lot of guys point to this i'm sure jeff would agree with me would be uh george lynch on under lock and key that's another one where the, the the improvement in production from tooth and nail to under lock and key is like like opening a lamp or uh, a uh, uh, window shade just like totally night and day and the guitar tone on that album is just incredible and then I, I would say accept balls to the wall that album what a great fucking hard rock 80s guitar tone there so you know, if you, you want to talk about sounds and stuff like that for this genre of music, he, he's in the top three. And th this is from a guy who 
who only had a cursory knowledge of it, but just you hear two or three tracks from the guy and it's like, Oh my God, that guitar tone is, is amazing. So, um, I liked it. I just, as we were bullshitting today, I loaded it on my iTunes and I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to, uh, getting a better feel for it. You know, um, I, I believe it or not, I enjoyed the experience. So, well, Man, that just makes me <laughs> it the, the the big fun of the show is sharing music that I love with friends and friends sharing music that they love with me. So I'm going through the Pumpkins catalog with Steve and discovering that a band I'd written off has a lot of great stuff and admitting to Steve, like, you know what, I was wrong about this and it's nice to get the new perspective. So I'm I'm really glad you enjoyed it. Steve, uh, how'd you feel about this one overall? I enjoyed it a lot. Uh this is you know, this is Basically, my taste in metal jumps straight from this kind of thing, the like 80s power metal to modern avant-garde jazz metal. And so, yeah, this is the this is about half of what I enjoy in metal. I was a little bit surprised that um, Chris and I uh, basically were in total agreement about everything except for yeah. the order that we should put the songs in. <laughs> yeah. Which we were well, in almost complete disagreements with. For me, a lot of like in the middle of the rankings, they all kind of blended together. And at some point I just had to assign a number to something. Right. Um, but, uh, but no, I, I, that was another cool thing about this episode. I thought is just that like I had this stuff written down and I kind of had thought I might be the only one to have been recognizing some of this stuff. But like, I think all four of us or you other three guys at some point mentioned something that I had written down or was going to mention. It's like, Oh yeah. Okay. They heard that too. That's kind of cool. So. Yeah. I think we all analyze the album pretty much the same way. It's just some of us like different parts of it more. Right. But yeah, yeah this was, Hey, this was a super fun episode. I want to thank our awesome guests for being on Jeff. Where can people find you on the internet or in real life? Uh, well, uh, on the internet, they can find me through my music shop, uh, thefretshack.com, and that's the who, what, and where on the shop. We're located in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and we service the entire Gulf South and the, I guess, the entire lower 48. And then um, do a Facebook search for the Fret Shack, and you will get a great day in the life of as far as all the insane stuff that comes in here. Yeah, I would... Uh... I'd like to just say that if you're a guitar nerd, or even more importantly, if you're a guitar player who uh, needs uh, work done on your instruments, or if you're touring through the area and you've, you're having some equipment problems, uh, definitely follow Jeff's uh, social media accounts. This guy is incredible what he can do to an instrument, custom work, uh, basic setup stuff, you name it. He can do it, and he's a hell of a guy. So uh, check it out, and um, you know, if you if, if, whatever you can imagine in terms of getting the guitar up to snuff or creating something you've always dreamed of, he can do it. And Chris, where can people find you on the internet? Uh, you're ba basically the uh, FBI's top ten most wanted is the first <laughs> place you can go. Uh, I'm not proud of that, but the That's truth awesome. is the truth. Um, no, I, I, I do Pot of Thunder, um, the uh, what we like to call the. Uh, I can't even remember the, the words recognized anymore, symbol of yeah, excellence in Kiss go. podcasting and America's favorite podcast. Yeah, yeah and, and <clears throat> we're we're closing in on the end of the kiss catalog so we will probably be transitioning into just general uh we'll still feel feature a different song um every episode but we're most likely going to open it up to just hard rock bands in general and maybe music from other genres as well but uh can i make a know, suggestion gonna... south side uh, by sure. moby uh, suggestion rejected. Thank <laughs> you for that, though. Um, well, here, Steve, here's what you need to do. You need to message Nick in private on Facebook, like, add this to the random song generator when Chris isn't looking. <laughs> yeah, if if you want to, if you want something added that's going to piss me off and 
speaking specifically of maybe ELO or some garbage like that, Nick is your avenue to do that because he, he will do things that uh, I don't even think is intentional anymore. He just does things that get my dander up. It's the very definition of Jones Brothers bullshit. So. I do like ELO quite a bit. Mr. Blue Sky is really catchy. Like yeah, catchy well, song. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna clam up at this point. <laughs> otherwise, my whole day will be shot. The whole rest of my day. <laughs> and Steve, where can people find us on the internet? Uh, LipstickGeneration.com is our main hub, but we're also on a bunch of major social media platforms. If we're there, we're probably under the name Lipstick Generation, unless they have character limits on their uh, usernames, in which case we're Mr. Cool Rock and Roll. Right, because that's less. It is M R C O O L. No, I know it's, <laughs> it's way less, way fewer characters. All right, well, that is our show. Thank you all so much, and we'll see you next week. Peace. I mean, I don't. I mean, they're another one of those bands where I don't think they have a bad album. Like, there's ups oh, and they downs. Have a bad album. You should. Uh, Dirty Work. I is, love Dirty uh, Work. One Hit oh, of the Body is my favorite figure. Stone song. <laughs> see that figure. Well, I, I forgot who I was talking to. Of course you like Dirty See, as work. soon as you th- said, that. I know there's a bad album, like he's going to say Dirty Work, isn't he? Uh, uh, come on, dude. <laughs> One Hit yeah. to the Body is so fucking awesome.